Good evening, everybody. We are going to be continuing tonight with our first extra lesson here on uh, the topic of stewardship. Uh, we, have, we covered the introduction to that and learned how God has given us different things in respect to our time, our talents, our treasures, and our temples or our bodies. And uh, throughout the course of this lesson, we've been looking at uh, what God expects of us in regard to our time, our talents, and our bodies itself, and, uh, and how we are stewards or caretakers of these things, uh, it's, and especially as it relates to in use to or in service for our, uh, the church. Last time we looked at how God has given each of us different talents and abilities, and how these are not, they do not belong to us alone exclusively, that uh, they belong as a part of a body of believers, a Christian congregation, that our talents and abilities belong to each other. Mine belong to you, yours belong to mine. And with respect to these talents and abilities, we shouldn't you know, despise what God has given to us because we don't maybe think that they're all that special or all that great, uh, while at the same time being jealous of maybe someone else who has something, what we view anyways as something better or greater. Uh, and quite often what happens is, yeah, they might have something good or great, but they lack in another area where you're a bit stronger. At the same time, we also don't want to look down on others and think, okay, well, they're not all that special or great, and I don't need them. But we should work to put these talents and gifts to use for the common good. Tonight, we're picking up then with part six, and uh, really getting at the root of everything here, our attitude toward service, because that's really where it all starts. And we got a couple of passages there. Uh, Luke 10, 17, basically what happened there was Jesus was sending out his dis uh, disciples, not just the 12, but he had more disciples than that, on, we see 72 here, to do some, I guess you could say, mission work, preaching about the kingdom of God. And as they return to Jesus, when they're done, it says that the 72 returned with joy. So that's going to be one, uh, when we look at this, uh, one of those attitudes that we're going to be looking at. Uh, the next passage, Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 8. Ladesha, would you mind reading that, please? Slaves, obey your human masters with respect and reverence, and with a sincere heart, just as you obey Christ. Do this not just when they're watching, as if merely to people to please people, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, serve with eagerness as for the Lord and not for people. Because you know that each person, whether slave or free, will receive back from the Lord whatever good he has done. Interesting here that Paul is talking about slaves, you know, being obedient to masters when we know that Paul was not a fan of the institution of slavery. But we got to keep in mind that slavery in ancient times was different in many respects to the slavery that we had in our nation's south, in our nation's history. That slavery was exclusively race-based. Uh, slaves had very little, if any, rights or freedoms back at, uh, down in the south. However, back then, slaves did have a little bit more rights and freedoms, and you might have become a slave for different reasons. Some of it might have been based on race. Of course, you had every race enslaving others, and people of their uh, same race enslaving uh, their, their own people throughout the course of history. Um, it might have been because, let's say, you know, Caleb, the, the, the conquering general who just has uh, beat another enemy nation, and so now as they return and they're bringing the, the plunders of war back, some of those, some of that plunder are the people that have been captured and they'll be forced into slavery. At other times, people could actually sell themselves into slavery to help pay off debts or if they can't take care of their family. Uh, slaves even could, through work and time of service, buy their freedom. So there was a, a, a bit more 
uh, rights that slaves had back then. Uh, I'm not going to get into the weeds on the whole slavery issue here right now, uh, but Paul uh, was hoping for slavery to uh, obviously be done away with in the ancient world, but he wanted that to happen in a healthy, peaceful way. And that was um, the way that it ultimately happened was by uh, people becoming Christian, actually, and uh, people being informed by their Christian beliefs that, hey, slavery, really not a good ideal thing, and they, they ended up freeing their slaves and uh, working against slavery. But notice here what it says. Serve with eagerness as for the Lord. In other words, yes, I might serve you guys right now as I'm teaching you, but what I really ought to be thinking of is doing this as if I were serving God himself. And that kind of changes the perspective on things. That, okay, if I'm serving God, I really want to make sure I'm doing my best, I'm doing it right, you know, that I have the right attitude about this. I mean, what a special opportunity uh, to be doing that. And it's a little bit of an extra motivator, I guess. Next passage, Aaliyah, 1 Peter 4, verse 9. So without complaining, don't complain about that opportunity to serve. It's interesting, you know, something that I have noticed in myself personally and just in watching others and um, their, their service toward people, there is joy to be found in serving others. There really is. Sometimes when I, some of the, 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 the saddest moods that I'm in, I find, is when I am just serving myself. And now, you, you do need to have some self-care, right? I, I'm not saying that we, we can't be ever taking care of ourselves, and that if we're uh, not serving others, that we're in, instead serving ourselves, that that's some sort of sin. That's not what I'm saying at all, because we, we definitely need to do some self-care. But when we spend too much time doing that, we can actually make ourselves more miserable by doing that. There is joy to be found in serving others, and knowing that we have helped others uh, with whatever is going on in their lives. And that's a good opportunity. And to do that then without complaining. Uh, Remy, Philippians 2, 14. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Okay, so adding an, an additional thought there of arguing, fighting over these things. You have a certain amount of emotional energy that has been given to you. Are the, is it worth it to have arguments over small stuff? Is it worth it to get emotionally worked up over the little things in life? No. Absolutely not. And so manage, manage those strong feelings and opinions well. So the question here is, what is the Christian attitude towards service? And I'll just give you all of them at once. First of all, serve without grumbling, complaining, or arguing. Second of all, find joy in serving others. And I talked about that, how that can be a true joy. Um, a joy, you know, even emotionally to bring tears to the eyes of people for the, the, their gratitude and knowing that you love them, you care for them, you are helping them out in their time of need. And then last of all, serving with all our hearts as if we were serving our Lord. Adesha. Long day? Mm -hmm. Now the next question is, whom do we serve? The first one, the obvious one, Anna, could you read Deuteronomy 6? Fear the Lord your God, serve him, and swear by his name. Alright, so obviously here, whom does God want us to serve? <laughs> Simple enough, God. I mean, when you look at the relationship between us and God, he, he describes it in different ways. Yes, he does call us his children or his sons, but it also is the relationship of master and servant. Uh, that is also a, a very apt description. 
Next passage, Jada, 1 Peter 4, 11, 10 and 11. Serve one another, each according to the gift he has received, as good stewards of the many forms of God's grace. If anyone speaks, let him do it as one speaking the messages of God. If anyone serves, let him do it as one serving with the strength God supplies, so that God may be glorified in every way through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. But pretty simple there, serving other people. Serve one another. And when you look at Galatians 5.13, it kind of says the same thing. After all, brothers, you are called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as a starting point for your sinful flesh. Rather, serve one another through love. In other words, you've been granted freedom. Freedom from the law. Freedom from uh, God's condemnation in the forgiveness of sins. Don't use this freedom, though, to be selfish to, uh, or to serve those sinful lusts and desires that go on inside of us. Instead, focus that desire for service outward on others through love. The next passage, yeah, you're going to be opening your Bibles, Luke 10, 38 to 42. Oh, you've got a Bible for confirmation? Yeah. 10, 38. Here you go. There you go. And we, two of you can at least follow along here. So we've got God. You've got other people. Wow. Really, then who else does that leave? Yourself. All right. But how? And that's what we're going to look at here. And I suppose there's a number of ways, but there's one way in particular that we're going to focus on. Jalen, could you read 38 to 42, please? As they went on their way, Jesus came into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who was sitting at the Lord's feet and was listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her servants. She came over and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left to serve alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord answering and told her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. In fact, Martha has, Mary has chosen that better part, which will not be taken away from her. All right, keep your Bibles open because we're going to be heading back uh, to another passage very close by in just a moment. So, you've got Mary and Martha. Any of you ever do any cooking? Ah, Adisha, what do you cook? A lot. You do a lot of cooking. Like what? Um, beef stroganoff, tacos, pizza. Um. Okay, tacos, kind of simple. Pizza, definitely simple. Heat up the oven. Put it on the tray, or if it's going to be directly on the rack, whatever. Pop it in for however many minutes it tells you, and then like homemade. Oh, oh, homemade. Oh, so you may. Okay, now that's a quite a bit more work. Wow. Do you buy the pre-made dough, or do you actually make the dough? No, we buy the pre-made dough. I usually do it with grandma. Well, it's all right. We make the sauce and stuff though. Nice. Wow. Good for you. The stroganoff. Nice. How about you, Aaliyah? Sweet. Some of you others, who, who else all had their hands up? What do you mean? Uh, all like breakfast food. Uh, breakfast food, or eggs, or uh, eggs, waffles, pancakes, like, um, pancakes, bacon, all that stuff. Nice, Anna. Like casseroles or egg cakes. My goodness. we got a more self-sufficient group in here, I think, than I did in uh, the, 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 the kids who are actually attending here right now. Nice. Who else? What else? Yeah. I just help my mom. I know this work. Just yeah, you help your mom with it? This is great, you guys. This is a good life skill to have, to know how to make uh, food that you're, you're already learning. Um, isn't it your uh, mother-in-law who kind of teaches that sort of class at uh, the middle school? Yeah. Uh, or not mother-in-law, your, your aunt. Lucky. Let's not rush things, right? Oh. <laughs> a little young to have a mother-in-law. Unless you're in one of those weird countries where they marry off 12, 13-year-old girls. That, that's just kind of creepy. So 
Yeah, no, nah, it's not this country, thankfully. Anyway, uh, yeah, your aunt teaches up that class. So, when you cook, how many, how many people do you typically cook for? Ladesha. Mom, when she was a cook, she said she cooked for hundreds a day. Yeah, that's quite a bit. It's a lot of work. Yeah, four, four or five. Four or five. All right, four. four. Remy. Five, yeah. That's a bit of work, though, when, you, when you're doing it for four or five people, right? Yeah. Jesus has come to town. He has come to your house. Now, it's not just Jesus. Bare minimum, how many others are going to be along with Jesus? Twelve. Twelve. So you got a bare minimum of thirteen. However, it's not just thirteen, because let's not forget... The others who are already there. Who's already there? Mary, Martha, and he's not necessarily mentioned in the text, but we can assume that he's here. Oh, yes, Lazarus. Lazarus, their brother. Right. So bare minimum, we're talking 16 people. That is quite a bit of mouths to feed. I, uh, for many years... When I lived in Wisconsin, would feed the WLA football team, Winnebago Lutheran Academy football team, after one of their games each year. A good 35, well, or, no, over 40 uh, people to feed. I would do tacos uh, and nachos, so I'd get 20 pounds of ground beef. But imagine cutting up all the the, the, the different vegetables in that, and I mean that is a lot of preparation. And that's for something kind of more simple like tacos. There's a lot of work that has to be done. When, when people come over, what are you going to do for them? Cook. You're going to cook. You're going to make food. Somebody has to do it, right? Was there anything wrong with Martha preparing food for their guests? No. Somebody's got to do it. And Jesus doesn't criticize her for doing it. Yeah. That's the opposite of our family. Like... We'll go, um, someone, or my grandma or aunt will come to our house, or we'll go to their house, and then we'll switch it up, and yeah. we'll cook for them at their house. Well, that's interesting. And they um, cook for us at their, our house. And okay. We'll, we'll still, sorry. We'll still help them, but um, yep. it's yeah. different. That's interesting. Okay. Well, anyway... So he's got to cook the meal. Martha, though, is, like, frustrated because... That's a lot of work. Her sister is not helping her. But Jesus says, no, you got it backwards because Mary has chosen the better part. What was Mary doing? Being served. How was she being served? Or really, in a way, how was she serving herself? Yes. She was sitting at Jesus' feet listening to the Lord. Exactly. So... God wants us to serve our own spiritual needs with his word and sacraments. Now, as I said, there's other ways that we can serve ourselves. Personal self-care, uh, rest, um, entertainment and recreation, uh, learning, or maybe just reading a book or something, exercise. Those are all good, appropriate ways to take care of ourselves. Um, but I wanted to focus us in on the one that can most easily, I think, be neglected by some people. Yes, Laudatia? Uh, no, not right now. Come to class with it filled. All right, so getting into then part eight, the Christian in action. Like I said, Keep your Bibles open. If you're in Luke already, we're going to Mark, which is the book right before. Mark 10, 35 to 45. Uh, looks like my next two readers are already there. That's awesome. Uh, Quinn, I would like for you to take 35 to 40, and Caleb, 41 to 45. Go ahead. And James and John, sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want to go to you to do... Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they 
said, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who have whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant. Indignant with Which means really upset. With John with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of Gentile of the Gentile Lord it over it over them, and their high officials exer- exercise authority mm-hmm. over them. Not so with you. Instead, whomever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first, may, first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. Yep. Adesha recognizes that. Keep your Bibles open. Uh, the next passage is just a couple Bible books down the road. So, James and John, they come to Jesus with a request. We hear elsewhere that their mom was also working behind this one here. But that request was, hey, when, when you get up to heaven, Jesus, and you're up there in glory, can you have one of us sit at your right, one at your left? Basically, we want this power and position. You know, we want the notoriety. We want the recognition. We want the service. You know, we want people serving us. And, well, the other disciples, they're quite upset about this. Why are they upset? Because they wanted it, and they're like, wait a minute, they beat me to it. Nuts! We're not going to get that position. They were jealous. And Jesus is like, hold on, no, 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 hold on, you guys. You have a complete misunderstanding of things in my kingdom. And now I'm going to show you something. Verse 45 Notice it says, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. God is our master. We are the servants. And yet, what does Jesus do with this master-servant relationship? He turns it on its head. And he says, I am going to serve you. And to do it in the most excellent way possible, even. I'm going to give my life as the ransom. A ransom is a sum of money or a payment that is used to release a person. Set them free from some sort of bondage or captivity or hostage. You know, a hostage, letting a hostage go. I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do for you. James and John and the other disciples, too, knew little about God's kingdom at this point in time. They didn't realize that, okay, the greatest in the kingdom is the one who makes himself the least. The next passage, John 13, 1 through 17. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I do want you to flip your Bibles over to it if you haven't already. And we're going to watch a video of this section, one of those stories from the Bible videos. Stories of the Bible. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. This is Jesus. hey Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. Uh, wahoo! 
At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus and his disciples went to Jerusalem to celebrate. Jesus had 12 men who followed him through his ministry. They were called his disciples. Jesus and his disciples gathered for one final meal together. Jesus got up from the table, took off his robe, and began to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus loved his disciples, and he knew the time was coming for him to leave them and return to heaven. When Jesus came to Peter, he said, Whoa, 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 wait! Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus said, You don't understand what I'm doing now, but someday you will. No! Peter said, You will never wash my feet. But Jesus then told him that unless he washed his feet, he would not belong to him. Oh, well then, okay! Then Peter said, then wash my hands and head as well, not just my feet. But Jesus told him that was not necessary. He just needed to wash his feet for Peter to become clean. So Jesus finished washing their feet and said that the disciples should do to others as he had done for them. He told them to follow the example that he had set for them to serve each other and not think of themselves as greater than any other. Then God would bless them for doing as Jesus had taught them to do. Washing feet. Mm, yummy. <laughs> What do you know about the practice of washing feet in ancient times? Anything? It was kind of royal. It was to clean clothes. Yeah? They had gross, dirty feet. Why did they have gross, dirty feet? Because they didn't wear shoes. They didn't wear shoes. They wore sandals. And as a result, what sorts of things got on your feet? What fungus? Snakes. <laughs> Snakes. Sand. Right. <laughs> like foot fungus. Ah, she went right to the worst of the worst. Yeah, yeah. When you're on the road and you got animals that have used the same road, you get animal droppings. And so you might get the poopies on your feet. So you got poop. You got, you got dirt and, and mud. Your, your, the, the feet got cracked and dried out. And it was the lowest task that a servant could do to wash someone else's feet. In fact, it was such a low task that if you had multiple servants, they would do anything they could to get out of doing that. Because, I mean, after all, who would want to wash a room full of dry, stinky, smelly, dirty man feet? <laughs> These are like, mm. no. I have to rub my mom's feet so it's not that big of a <laughs> I love my mom, but... You love your mom. What a wonderful, beautiful service you're doing for your mama. All right. And this is what Jesus goes to do. Now, take a look at verse 15. Ladesha, read verse 15 for us. And what does Jesus say about when he washed his disciples' feet? No, that's not John 13, verse 15. Oh, I'm in Luke. I'm yeah, all right. We're skipping over you. Uh, we're going to go to Anna. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Yeah, he's given us an example. He's set an example for us. That Jesus, our Lord and Master... Condescending to do the lowest of possible conceived tasks. Now, what does he mean that he's set an example for us? 
Yes, Caleb. You showed that no, no one's really better than other people. And you're on the right track. No one is better than others, and I should not think of myself so highly that those sorts of service are beneath me. So the answer I have here for you, we should not think that any act of service is beneath us. Back during my vicar year, uh, there was an elderly couple at my church, Ed and Marilyn Abbey were their names. Wonderful, wonderful uh, couple. And one night at a church service, might have been a midweek Lent service, might have even been Monday Thursday, well, probably wasn't Monday Thursday, but an evening service, uh, myself and the other, uh, one of the pastors on staff, Pastor Cox, were shaking hands and greeting people as they walked out, and somehow it came up that uh, met Ed and Marilyn uh, said that they had to invite me over for supper sometime. And I was like, oh yeah, great idea. But then they said, and then you can help us weed the garden. And I was like, okay. You know, but on the inside, I was thinking, oh, <laughs> right. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that, that sort of work. And I, I know I did not show that attitude on my face because many years later I asked, actually it was, uh, I think it was just a couple of years ago uh, when I met up with, with Pastor Cox at a, a restaurant in La Crosse. He, he probably, he didn't remember the incident anyway, but um, he looks at me and almost intuitively and with a smile on his face, he said, and you will do it. And every time I read this scripture reading, I, I look back on myself and my attitude, thinking that I was above that sort of menial work and helping out a couple of old people who, you know, have a hard time bending down and getting on their knees to weed a garden. I, I, I feel really bad about that, that I was having that attitude like, oh, this is beneath me. Because it really wasn't. Nothing is. If our Lord and God can condescend to washing feet, if our Lord and God can step down off of his throne and suffer and die for us to serve us, there ain't nothing that is beneath us. Also, during my vicar year, there was a girl in the sixth grade. Her name is Kira. Kira, wonderful girl, wonderful, beautiful heart. And she was, I don't know if it was asked or tasked, with providing a, a kind of service for her grandmother that most sixth graders wouldn't even imagine. The kind of care that you find in nursing homes with, with people who are unable to make it to the bathroom. Yes, same age as you, Aaliyah. Doing that level of work, cleaning and changing diapers. Depends is what they're called, big di diapers for grown-ups. What an amazing thing that this sixth grade girl rendered that sort of loving service to her grandma. Wow. And, and it's always stuck with me that she did that. Jesus, our Lord and Master, has set an example for you and me. An example to follow. An example of how to put our love, his love, into action. Next question. When Jesus washed feet, he didn't wait for someone to ask him to do it. What does this tell us about the kind of service that he rendered? He didn't ask to do it. He just upped and did it. Or no, no I should, let me rephrase that. Nobody asked him to do it. In fact, all the disciples, you know, they're kind of sitting there waiting like, oh, there's no servant. Who's, who's going to do this? Hope it's not me. Hope it's someone else. Please let someone else do it. Oh, thank goodness. Wait a minute. No, 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 not Jesus. But, but well. Anyway, 
What does this tell us about the kind of service he rendered? He just got up and did it. What does it tell us about his attitude? Yeah. Think of the name like responsibly? No. The word I'm looking for starts with a V. That describes his service. He wasn't told what to do. <laughs> Who's going to tell Jesus what to do? Especially voluntary. That. Voluntary. Yeah. Voluntary. It was voluntary. And what lesson can we learn from this? That Jesus wants us to volunteer, right? He wants us to volunteer to serve. And what happens a lot of times, and throwing this into the context of a church. The pastor makes the announcement, hey, we need extra help with ushers or with uh, helping with the, the, the screens during the service or recording the service, or we need help with something else, Sunday school teachers or whatever. And what happens? You know, people put their heads down, oh, please don't look at me, please don't look at me. I, I, I don't want to get hit with this. And you know, they look around and they, they wait and see, okay, is someone else going to do this? They hope that it's not them. You know, they hope that they're not quote-unquote, shanghai into doing it. Uh, please let it be someone else. Interestingly enough, uh, as I got in the bold type there in your packet, uh, back in 2001, uh, the Reverend Alan Newton at the Underwood Memorial Baptist Church in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, uh, wrote a following tongue-in-cheek obituary for one of the most valuable members of his congregation, uh, Wauwatosa is a suburb of Milwaukee. I actually drove by this church probably hundreds of times throughout the years growing up and into my adulthood. Anyway, here's what it says, and hopefully you'll understand the satire, the slash uh, tongue-in-cheek nature of this. Dear friends, I know all of you were saddened to learn this week of the death of one of our church's most valuable members, someone else. Someone's passing created a vacancy that will be difficult to fill. Else has been with us for many years, and for every one of those years, someone did far more than the normal person's share of work. Whenever leadership was mentioned, this wonderful person was looked to for inspiration as well as results. Someone else can work with that group. Whenever there was a job to do, a class to teach, or a meeting to attend, one name was on everyone's lips. Let someone else do it. It was common knowledge that someone else was among the largest contributors to the church. Whenever there was a financial need, everyone just assumed that someone else would make up the difference. Someone else was a wonderful person, sometimes appearing superhuman, but a person can only do so much. Where the truth known, everyone expected too much of someone else. Now, someone else is gone. We wonder what we are going to do. Someone else left a wonderful example to follow, but who is going to follow it? Who is going to do the things that someone else did? Who is going to respond to the call to serve and help? Remember, we can't depend on someone else anymore. You get the point? If you keep waiting for someone else to do it, there's a number of things that happen, or maybe better said, don't happen. One, everybody is going to have this same idea, this same hope. Nobody is going to volunteer. And two, you are depriving your church, your body of believers, of that opportunity to put your gifts and talents to use in service to others. Even at your young age, you have the ability to help and serve. Even at your young age. So when those opportunities come up, and there are always plenty of them, keep them in mind.
Part nine, last part here, the most important way that we can serve God and others. I wasn't always really sure on exactly where to stick this, in which lesson or whatever. Uh, and so I ended up putting it here in respect to service of others. Uh, we got a, a couple of passages here. Uh, Ladesha, could you take Mark 16, please? Jesus said to me, go into, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So, based off of that passage, what is the most important way that we can serve God and others? Preaching. Yeah, preach the gospel. Preach the Share the good news about Jesus with others. Okay, before we continue, uh, let's get the next passage. Aliyah, I'm going to have you read that. Just so you know, Aliyah, I'm going to be cutting you off at several points to ask a question or to have us really answer uh, the questions that are being asked, uh, or uh, rather, uh, that are being asked in the passage and they're implying an answer. All right, so go ahead and start reading. Stop. How can they call on the one they haven't believed in? The answer? They can't. Keep going. And how can they believe in the one about whom they have not heard? Again, the answer? They can't. Keep going. And how can they hear without a preacher? Again? They can't. They can't. And last of all? All right. It is true that some people, because of the accessibility to the Bible and God's Word these days, online and in bookstores and whatnot, I mean, the Bible for centuries has been by far the most uh, reprinted book in the history of the world. By a long shot. There's nothing that's ever going to come anywhere close to it. But even so, the vast majority of people uh, who are led to the Christian faith are led not so much by them just picking up and reading a Bible, but by somebody sharing that good news with them. Whether it's through a podcast, an online sermon, uh, maybe a Facebook post, but th those aren't as personal. Usually it comes from one person talking to another person, or from one person inviting another person to church. But it almost always comes through verbal communication, direct communication. And what does that tell us about the role that we play and how important that is? To answer that, what we're going to be doing, we're going to watch a video of uh, that man there that you see in the red box, uh, actor, magician, and an avowed atheist, uh, Penn Gillette. He has a, uh, a performance thing that you can go and watch in Las Vegas, even to this day, currently, 2023. Uh, now, this guy is very knowledgeable about the Christian faith, even for an atheist, in fact, I would bet dollars to donuts that he knows more about the Christian faith and that he can articulate the Christian faith better than you guys even can at, at this point in your lives. And I've seen it before. Of course, interestingly enough, in the video that we're about to watch, he uh, mistakenly uh, thinks that the Bible book Psalms is in the New Testament when it's in the Old Testament. But he has something pretty important to say. He rambles on for quite a bit at the very start, and you're wondering where he's going. He does eventually get to it. Uh, his hair and whatnot are a bit more disheveled than what it looks like in the, the uh, picture there where he looks nice and polished. Uh, and so he kind of looks weird and crazy in this and the way he talks and his, some of his mannerisms and the camera angle and all that just kind of contribute to this weird, 
quirkiness about it, but I can tell you he's not a quirky guy at all. Um, now, for those who are watching online, you're not going to be able to watch the video in this video because I, I, I'm not able to put it in the video because of copyright laws. Uh, Penn Gillette will say, no, you can't do that. Uh, I know I've tried, and they're done that. So um, there will be a link in the description that you can go to uh, to watch the video. I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show, and at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we uh, we talk to folks and you know sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the um, what I call the hover position after I was all done. Big guy, probably about my age. Big guy, and. Um, he had been the um, the guy who has uh, picks the joke during our psychic comedian section of the show. Uh, so we had the props from that in his hand because we give those away. He had the you know, the joke book and the and the envelope and the paper and stuff. If you haven't seen the live show, I, uh, it's not worth explaining. But he had props from the show that we'd given him from the night before. Uh, he wasn't the guy that night, and he walked over to me and he said. Um, I was here last night at the show, and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted. And he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about you know honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, "I brought this for you," and he handed me a uh, Gideon Pocket Edition. Um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. A little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. And then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane, I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive. And he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not, getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, 
and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave you that book. That's all I wanted to say. Anybody know what that word proselytize means? Have you even ever heard of it? It has to, yeah, pretty close. Proselytize basically is sharing your belief with someone uh, in the hopes and the efforts uh, to get them to believe as you believe. All right? That's what proselytizing is. So sharing your faith. And I, I really like what he said there. I'll, I'll read it again in the red box. He said, I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there is a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, and atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, you know, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize, not to share your faith? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them about that? If I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. Ouch. That really, I think, is a big gut check for a lot of Christians. How much do you have to hate somebody to think, you know what, I don't care about you enough to share with you the one message that's going to get you to heaven. I think it's a profound misunderstanding about the Christian faith, about our own faith, if we're not doing that. When Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations by baptizing and teaching. When Jesus dies on the cross, and the cross pretty much rules out all other options of getting to heaven, right? Because if I could get to heaven in a way other than through faith in Jesus and his death for our sins, that really makes his death on the cross pointless. Because why would you go through something like that if there is plan B or C or D or E, whatever, and on how to get to heaven. And now you're making God out to be the biggest idiot of all time for doing something like that when it meant nothing. The cross really says, this is the only way possible. And the only way I receive the benefits of that is through faith in that. And the only way that faith really comes as we already heard for the vast majority of people, is through somebody preaching to us. Aliyah and Ladesha. Please focus. And so, getting to the next question here, react. According to a 2021 Barna study, only 29% of Christians believe that reaching unchurched people around the world is very urgent. What do you got to say about that? Just 29%, not even a third of Christians a couple years ago, based on a poll from Barna Group, which is an official polling group, found that Obviously, there's a margin of error with any poll, of course, but the margin of error is not like 50 points one way or the other. It's just a few percentage points, usually. What does that tell us about Christians in general? Anything? 
Any ideas? Some people don't think it's as important to tell a verse or gospel. Yeah. There's a profound misunderstanding about our faith, isn't there? Uh, in the general society of America, that, we, that this is important. It's vitally important. If it wasn't important, Jesus wouldn't have told us, go and make disciples. And I like what Penn Jillette said, that, you know, if there's a truck coming at you, and you're not aware of it, and I'm yelling at you, and you're not moving, eventually I'm going to tackle you. I had a couple of classmates uh, from high school, before they got to my high school, previous high school, uh, they had a, a classmate who was, I don't know if he was depressed or, or what was going on, but uh, their school was located near some railroad tracks, and this kid wanted that train that was coming to take care of the deed for him. He tried to end his own life by standing on the tracks. And actually, it might have been three classmates. Yeah, it was three classmates. And these three classmates all had to get him off of the tracks and tackle him and hold him down while that train passed by. If we see somebody in that situation, we are going to do that. Absolutely. I mean, you are an absolute jerk if you don't make that effort. And as Penn says, this is more important than that. An atheist gets this. Why can't we? Just because it makes us feel awkward or uncomfortable. So what? Since when is it awkward and uncomfortable? To be loving. I don't get that. Next question, number three. Why, why will a redeemed child of God be concerned with sharing good news about Jesus with people? Well, I think we've already answered that question, haven't we? Out of love. Because hell is a real place. Jesus' death on the cross shows us that. If, you know, if hell weren't real, Jesus wouldn't have done that. If hell weren't real, Jesus wouldn't have talked about it more than anybody else in the Bible and by a wide margin. This matters. And this is the mission that the opportunity, maybe even better, that Jesus has given to each one of us to share that good news of our faith. And you guys especially, being in public education, you have a wonderful opportunity. In fact, you guys, in some respects, are better geared for doing this than I am. Because my whole life pretty much in my work, it's either with my family at home or I'm here at church. Well, what kind of people are here at church? Other Christians. They're already in the kingdom of God. They already, you know, have that faith. And I'm interacting with them. I don't have as much real world experience of talking with people who are not Christian. You have that already more. Well, mostly anyway. Well, maybe not as much, but you understand the point I'm making. You know how to relate to them better. You know how to talk to them better. You know how to present this in a way that might, you know, show them respect for their different values and beliefs, but at the same time, giving them, extending them that invitation to either hear the gospel or believe in the gospel, sharing the gospel itself. And you have the opportunity. You know, that's what I end up lacking sometimes, and because of the long hours I put in at, in the day and then at night, I'm not getting out into the community. I don't have that opportunity. Maybe at times through my work, you know, somebody comes to church and like a, a lady in my office last week looking to enroll a couple of her students at, uh, 
at St. Martin's for the next school year. Ask her church background. She has absolutely no church background, never attended church really in her whole life. Wow. Thank you, Lord, for uh, putting this woman into my office, and I, I pray that we'll have that opportunity. Uh, you know, I didn't talk more with her about the Christian faith at that moment because we were on a time crunch and focused on, on school, but through school, through her children uh, coming here, Lord willing, next school year, we'll have that opportunity. And that is so exciting, so wonderful. Last year, I had a, a family that came into my office. Dad had some background with Christianity. Mom said, as far as my Bible knowledge, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being a little, 10 being a lot, I'm a zero. Had the chance to take her through instruction, and uh, they're now members. Pretty awesome. Awesome opportunity to see that light bulb of faith go on in people and then start to talk the faith. All right, question number four. You guys ever hear of Mahatma Gandhi? Gandhi at all? Yeah, he was a, he was a guy um, uh, in, a guy from India, uh, philanthropist. Or it's like, well, <laughs> you hear some of the, the personal things from Gandhi's life. And he, he wasn't as great a guy as he's sometimes billed to be, but he's a famous Indian nationalist who taught nonviolent resistance to British occupation of India. It's where Martin Luther King Jr. got the whole idea of nonviolent resistance to racial injustice. But Mahatma Gandhi once said that he liked Christ, but not Christians, because their actions don't mirror those of Jesus. In past generations, the first question people asked was, is it true? Now another question is all that matters. Is it, that is your faith, real in your life? In other words, do we walk the walk and talk the talk? And so you look at that, and if, uh, the question then is, what do these two related thoughts, I'm sorry, shouldn't have done that, what do these two related thoughts have to do with our lives and sharing our faith? What it means for you is this, and I really hope that you are listening since you are out in the public, in the schools. You, at all times, represent your Lord. In everything that you, you say and do, and people are watching, they always watch how you are behaving. And believe me, I have heard more than a fair share of people say that what exactly what Gandhi is saying. That they reject the Christian faith because they don't see it to be livable. Meaning, they don't see Christians living what they claim to believe. Whether that's, you know, teenagers swearing up a storm or, or cutting down um, one another or uh, doing other sorts of bad things, uh, misbehaving class, whatever it might be. I have heard more than a fair share of people say that, what, what Gandhi said. I also have heard more than a fair share of people who said, because of the actions of others, that helped to bring me to the Christian faith. In fact, the early Christian church, how is it that it grew from such a small number to become the official religion of the Roman Empire? And this, in spite of the fact that the Roman Empire was actively persecuting and killing Christians. I mean, you if you know that becoming a Christian could put um, a death sentence over your head for the rest of your life, you're not going to make that decision lightly to become a Christian, right? You know, it's not casual Christianity in America these days where if I'm a Christian, it doesn't really cost me anything. It was back then, Christianity came with a serious cost. You don't do that unless certain things are happening. Why do you think people did it? Because they were seeing their example. Like, All right. Must be true. Are their lives One reason... 
was, first of all, not what you're saying, one reason was that Christians were willing to die for their faith. They're not, you know, in a fight, like they're going to go to war and, and try to win this war, and if they fall on the field of combat, okay, so what? You know, dying in a blaze of glory? No, this is dying like I'm, I, come, I show up at your door, and I arrest you, and I kill you you know, like a lamb to the slaughter sort of thing. People were willing to lay down their lives. You didn't find that in the religions of the ancient world. People weren't willing to die for their gods. And others took notice of that, that, wow, this must mean that it's worth it. It cost them something, but they were willing to pay that ultimate cost. Second reason, exactly what you're getting at. The example of love that the Christians showed. Uh, in fact, one of the Roman emperors, uh, Julian the Apostate, regretfully acknowledged that one of the things that was causing so many people to come to the Christian faith was the kindness and the love that Christians showed among each other and to others in their community, even to their enemies. Do Christians have that sort of reputation today? Your answer could be somewhat mixed, I think. In some respects, absolutely. In others, not really. And so this is a good reminder for us, something for us to be aware of as we conduct ourselves out in society that, yes, what we preach is important because it is true. And if, it, you know, if it's true, then it's believable. If it's believable, then it's livable. But for the people that, um, that we encounter, a lot of times they start at the opposite end. Is this livable? If they see it in your life that's livable, well, then it must be believable. And if it's believable, it must be true. That's the way it goes these days. Let your faith shine in the words in the, that you speak, in the example that you set, in the love that you show. And you're going to make Christ attractive to others when that time comes for you to speak of him. And you may not even be aware that you're doing it. Question number five. How might memorizing Bible passages help you as you share your faith? This is one of the big reasons why I've had you memorize Bible passages. Quinn? So when you're trying to explain the Bible or things of the Bible, you can go off passages? Yeah. This, instead of saying, well, I think I heard this somewhere in the Bible, and it kind of sounds something like this, and you probably end up messing up some of the important uh, key truths or points, you can say, no, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And Ladesha, there's a reason why Ladesha knows a lot of these passages better than uh, most of you. Aaliyah probably knows it too, because they attended school here, and there's a lot more emphasis put on memorization in our schools than in the public school. And that's been true since probably before I was even born. That's just, and I know that from my own experience. I went public school K to six and then Lutheran elementary school in seventh and eighth grade. So, um, but there's a benefit to memorizing those Bible passages for ourselves personally and for those comforting truths for us to take with us for ourselves, but also for other people as well to share the, those truths of scripture with others. And over the years, you know, I've had the opportunity to memorize probably hundreds of Bible passages and even entire sections of the Bible. I could rattle off for you in the NIV translation all of Romans 8, 31 to 39. Oh yeah, easily. I, I know sections. I memorize sermons every week. Why should you be surprised if I memorize a Eight passages or nine passages. Yeah, I memorize it. 
Think about when I'm standing up front. You think I'm just and with no manuscript in front of me because I'm not in the pulpit. You think I'm just making it up on the fly? Yeah. Sometimes. No. I think that's oh. it's improv. Oh my Every once in a while, there is some improv that goes into it. Yes. But by and large, what I am saying is, if not word for word, very close to word for word what I have written. Very close. Not as much as it used to be. As I've gone on over time, um, I realize as I memorize, well, that's not how I'm going to say it. Um, once I look at it, like, no, that's not how I talk. And so I'll, I'll do it like as a, how I talk. But um, either way, that, that getting back to this point, memorizing Bible passages can be a great help and great tool in sharing your faith. All right, last of all, uh, John 1, 45 and 46. Uh, Jada, would you mind? Or no, I'm sorry, Remy. Yeah. We, we left off there. Remy, would you Philip read that? found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Come and see, Philip told him. So... Uh, Nathaniel objected to Philip's, uh, Philip saying, hey, I found the Messiah. And he, he throws out this, this um, objection. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? It's like talking about, let's say, like one of the, the worst dumps in America. Let's just, I'll say Gary, Indiana. If you ever go there, there's a reason why it's called the armpit of America. It stinks. Literally, with all the foundries and whatnot, it stinks. Uh, Gary... Anything good come from there? Um, my hometown, West Dallas, another suburb of Milwaukee, was known for a lot of, well, I'll be blunt, white trash. Uh, Dirty Stallus is its nickname. I also called it White Trash Alice. It's gotten a little better in, in recent years from what I'm told and what I hear. But, you know, it'd be like, Stallus, did anything good come from there? And what did Philip say? Did Philip have an explanation to say, yes, from Nazareth. The, the scripture is Isaiah chapter 9 talks about how, um, how Galilee was going to be blessed and how the Messiah would appear in Galilee. He didn't say that. He didn't know it. Or he didn't remember it. Now, if he had a good knowledge of the scriptures, he might have pointed to Isaiah 9 and, and told uh, uh, Nathaniel about it. But instead, what did Philip do? He said, come and see. He just said, come and see. So, you know, um, this is back when Jesus was calling his first disciples. So what can we learn from Philip when we want to share Jesus with someone else? That if somebody has a question and we don't know how to answer it, what do we do? Bring it toward you. Come and see. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we maybe share what we do know, but we don't try to make up answers on our own and end up saying the wrong thing. We say, you know what? I don't know that, but why don't you come to church with me? On Sunday, or why don't you come and talk with me and the pastor, meet my pastor? He might have a question, or might be able to answer your question. So the invitation method is what Philip did. Come and see. Nathaniel was open-minded. He came. He became a disciple of Jesus. And so that's what you guys can do. If you don't know the answer, that is okay. You know, there are times when I don't know the answer to a particular uh, scriptural or spiritual question. And rather than trying to fumble through a bad answer, or even if I kind of know the answer, but I am not able to give a good, complete response to it, it's only a half answer, I'll say, you know what? I don't know, but I'll get back to you. I'm not necessarily inviting them to go come with me to another pastor because, well, I am a pastor, but, well, sometimes maybe I'll work there. Anyway, um, that, that's what you can do, all right? You don't have to feel like you're, you, you've been defeated if you don't have all the answers. That is okay. You are young. You are growing. You are learning. We're always learning, myself included. Any uh, closing questions or comments at all? All right, let's close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us all. Amen.
Have a good night.